Welcome to Slash Forward. Who is a more effective killer between a large and strong man with limited life experience and a petite high school aged girl with a burning desire to inflict bodily harm? The answer might surprise you, but we're going to get into it right now. Let's get to it. We open on a large house where, within its confines, a group of teens gather around the fire pit to imbibe and tell tales of the Blissfield Butcher, a perennial maniac who's been slaughtering youngsters every year since 1977. Ginny, however, is unimpressed as she identifies this story as an urban legend used to prevent teenage debauchery around homecoming time. Overzealous to ramp up the spook factor, Isaac instead commits a major party foul. So Sandra goes to clean up and he gets the hint to give the two lovebirds some privacy. After scoping out the bitchin' art collection inside, he makes his way to the cellar to collect some red wine, every teenager's favorite libation. A sudden noise causes him to drop the bottle, and his cleanup efforts are interrupted when a large man provides direct bottle service to his gullet, causing his throat to blossom. Back upstairs, Sandra finishes wiping herself down in the bathroom when someone starts knocking aggressively on the door. Not taking her failure to respond as a desire for privacy, he busts down the door and gives her head the business with a toilet seat. Meanwhile, Jenny is also getting the business in the garage. Evan waddles out after her, begging for a finisher, and gets more than he was hoping for, as a tennis racket is crammed into both sides of his head. Jenny runs off, but her pursuer continues after her with poise and confidence, showing the patience of a seasoned expert. Despite this expertise, he misses the falsity in the back of the closet. And despite being perfectly safe back there, Jenny emerges after after he leaves. When daddy arrives, she runs out foolishly, getting the blunt end of the spear. The butcher then snags the ceremonial dagger he came for and leaves the parents to clean up his mess. Rude. The next day, we wake up with Millie, living a cozy family lifestyle that's just her and the ladies. Her sister Charlene shames her for planning to ditch homecoming to attend the theater with her mom. But they're just doing the best they can, trying to get by after dad died. Then she meets up with Josh and Nyla on her way to school. They also try to convince her that homecoming would be a positive experience, as her crush Booker is going, and they strive every day to help her own her burgeoning sexuality. It's just that she gives so much of herself to everyone else. When's it gonna be her turn to get what she wants and deserves? We then learn via Ryler and her friend group that Millie is subject to daily passive aggressive bullying from the student body, and when she arrives at shop class late, aggressive aggressive bullying from the faculty. She gets embarrassed in front of Booker when she's called to present her project a week early, but she's ultimately saved by the bell alerting the students of their fallen comrades. Our trio of friends meet up at their normal lunch spot to gossip about the recent string of murders, and Josh suggests this to be the work of the butcher. The girls aren't buying it, but he also predicts these events won't slow down the town's thirst for homecoming, and that turns out to be true, so... After the game, Millie hangs back since her mom is coming to pick her up. Unfortunately, she finds herself still waiting after the entire crowd has dispersed, because her mom is deep into a bottle of Chardonnay. Char calls to let her know, but then her phone dies, leaving her to sit in silence. But she's not lonely for long as she peers across the vacant lot and sees a man patiently waiting for an invitation to come over. She tries to warn him off, but he is undeterred. So Millie does her best to scramble away with that absolute dump truck of an ass. She ducks out below the bleachers and, when the coast seems to be clear, emerges. But he's right there. He tackles her on the field under the light of the full moon and penetrates her shoulder with the wisdom of the ages. He seems to suffer a reciprocal wound, but before he can provide any context, Charlene arrives and runs him off. That night, she gets some good restorative sleep, but wakes up in an unusual mindset, that of a middle-aged psychopath, and she glances around her surroundings as if seeing everything for the first time again. Meanwhile, on the other side of town, in the taxidermy district, the butcher also wakes up feeling refreshed but confused. Only rather than staying tight-lipped about it, he openly wonders about his voice and bodily characteristics. When his roomie pops in looking for some drugs, he claims to have none. But his queries... Do I look like a, um... You know, do I look like a girl? Would suggest otherwise. We get final confirmation of a successful body swap back at Millie's house, where motherly comfort seems to be foreign to her, while she also exhibits a newfound enthusiasm for the promise of a nutrient-dense breakfast. Millie, now the butcher incarnate, ponders the notion of killing her family, but he's distracted from this task by the mention of school and friends, an exciting proposition for any enthusiast of murdering teenagers. So while Millie tries to make her way through town toward the school while remaining inconspicuous despite her massive new frame, the butcher is similarly trying to find a way to let his own personality traits shine through in his new body. As he struts into school, we see he managed to get his hair done reasonably well, and he chose to go with a bold red lip, which really sets the boys off. 
He stalks the hallways trying to decide where to start, when Ryler pops in to suckle on some of that victim's clout and they head off to a private location. So as Millie sneaks in the back, Ryler leads the butcher to the quiet solitude of the locker room, where she tries to get her new bestie to puke up all the swarthy deets about the attempted homecoming game murder. However, the butcher remains disinterested. Fed up with the lack of gossip feeding her soul, Ryler takes a pee break. When she emerges, she hears some running water and is shocked to find a large man in there. She runs out for safety and the butcher helpfully hides her in a cryo chamber, where he hopes they'll have a cure for terrible personalities sometime around 2455. Millie finds her here, which provides confirmation that she's trailing just behind the butcher. Back in Gen Pop, the announcement goes out that the homecoming dance has been indefinitely postponed due to recent circumstances. The butcher gets dragged into class and, without missing a beat, demonstrates how not ready Booker is to get on his level, while Mr. Bernardi successfully attracts his full attention through harassment. Meanwhile, in the auditorium, the Monster Squad is noting how unusual it is for Millie not to meet them for lunch. When she suddenly appears, she attempts to bend their ears for a few minutes to convince them to trust her, while also fending off their defensive attacks. After they all get themselves tuckered out from the beatings and the physical violence, she performs her mascot routine with the vigor and technical acuity that only the real Millie could. Afterward, she answers all their personal questions to convince them further. Once trust has been established, they move on to phase two, which involves filling them in on the details of the body swap situation while making a series of relatable observations. Standing in ping is kind of rad. Luckily, Josh is a master of Google research and quickly finds the dagger in question. It's called Ladola, and given its origins, they seek out an interpretation of its inscriptions from the Spanish teacher, who reveals to them that its cursed effects become permanent after 24 hours. And since the butcher never called no stab backs, they have to find him and jab him with Ladola before midnight. As they run off to sort this out, he returns to Mr. Bernardi's room to get his revenge. However, he learns quickly that his new frame doesn't hold up against punishment in quite the same way. Despite this, he hangs in there and picks his moment, gaining the upper hand with a flat head to the neck. Mr. Bernardi then removes it, sealing his demise. But just for style points, the butcher lays him out on the table and gives him a Miko's classic. Although this time, with a sharper blade and a larger budget, he takes him all the way downtown. Upon exiting the classroom, the two swappers have a brief standoff, which ends when he finally settles fully into his role and takes advantage of not looking like a notable serial killer. The trio makes it to Josh's car and he gets its little four-banger screaming like a howler monkey as they speed off and try to determine the best way to hide their friend. The call goes out about the butcher being escorted by two utes, and Charlene picks it up right as they pass. So she takes off in hot pursuit, but they dip into a nearby parking lot and stash Millie away in a dressing room. Once the heat dies down, they fix her up with a serviceable mask, and then they note via social media that the butcher is enamoring himself to the boys. He suggests that they conduct a secret underground homecoming party at the old abandoned mill, and then he gets a bit randy with the Bradster. I can't wait to kill you. And when he walks off, Booker follows. Luckily, the gang shows up and sees the impending murder on the security monitor, so they all head back to the haunted miniature golf course. While Millie does manage to save Booker, she's forced to take them both out to avoid blowing her cover. Then they all settle in back at Josh's house, where Booker comes out of his coma like he's waking up from a nap. Millie attempts to explain the situation to him while the butcher undermines her at every turn, but she wins him over by dramatically reciting a moving poem that she anonymously dropped in his locker the other day, and it gets his pants to fit in funny. Now established as a quartet, they have to decide who is the baritone, and also how to get into the police evidence locker to retrieve Ladola. They leave Josh to watch over the butcher while they make their way to the police station. Nyla takes the lead here and rushes in to claim that she just escaped the butcher's clutches and that he ran around out back. Meanwhile, Josh's mom comes home early, putting him in an awkward situation. The best he can do is claim they are role-playing, but his mom's been around the world, and she recognizes role-play to be a sex game forcing him to try to cover by coming out as straight. Fed up with the nonsense, she attempts to free him right as he takes care of it himself, and they both excitedly scream run their way down the hallway. Josh calls to warn Nyla that the butcher is free, but this distracts her long enough to get caught in the act by Charlene, who returns from the alley and draws down on her. The station then bursts into confusion as everyone converges there at the same time. Millie's presence allows the butcher to escape out the back where she jacks the cruiser and nearly runs down Josh, just as he arrives at the station. Inside, Char is attempting to walk herself 
closest turn to a cell, but gets reversed after a brief distraction. After apologies and smooches, the kids then run off to the mill party to meet their destiny. They arrive there behind the butcher and confirm they have about 13 minutes to pull this off. Time to stab this asshole. Always ahead of them, the butcher has made his preliminary selection, allowing himself to be lured into a jock jam situation in which he easily takes out the non-varsity players before arming himself with a chainy and performing a sloppy amateur vasectomy. As they search for him, Josh is led to a back room by Phil, who claims to have information on Millie's whereabouts, but it turns out he was only interested in trying to verify his sexuality. Before he can get closure on this, however, he becomes fodder for the gore hounds by getting a surprise hook in the eye. Here again, everyone converges simultaneously, and in the resulting confusion, the butcher manages to slip out. However, by calling on the speed of youth, they manage to get him pinned down with five minutes to spare, so Millie can get to stabbing. This time, the magic helpfully provides an immediate switchback. Convenient, because upon Josh's command, SHOOT THAT MOTHERFUCKER! The police pass down an extrajudicial sentencing. While Booker and Millie finally get an intimate moment to and as themselves, the butcher is carted off in an ambulance. He flatlines along the way, but with indications of deception. Later at home, after some time to calm and cuddle, Millie hears a noise and finds the back door open. Now paranoid, she checks to make sure everything is okay and the coast appears to be clear, but only because this is a matter of perspective. The butcher's here for revenge, but she's still seeking the degree of personal growth that would provide a satisfactory conclusion to her character arc. So, after triple teaming him to the best of their abilities, she manages to drum up the courage to bring the big man down via wooden stake through the sternum. And now, the ladies are ready for whatever the future brings. Freaky is a fantastic recent release. It's an excellent example of a simple premise done well, with a perfect balance of suspense and humor and a willingness to go hard with the gore. This would be a definite recommendation for anyone. Given the uneven quality of some recent releases, I'm not sure you would fail to have a good time watching this movie. Now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.